What's up guys, in this video, I wanna go over three tips that you can use when you need to evaluate the composition of inverse functions. The first tip is to know your restrictions. Now, what I mean by knowing your restrictions is you need to know the restrictions on the domain when you're doing the inverse trigonometric functions. So just a quick little recap, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you have these. So if you don't already have them or memorize, make sure you go ahead and write them down. Okay, so basically what that's saying is if I'm taking the sine inverse or the tangent inverse, I'm gonna get a value of y. However, that y is going to be restricted between the values of negative pi halves, which is also like negative 90 degrees, and pi halves, which would be a positive 90 degrees. For cosine, for when we're taking the inverse of cosine of a value, we're gonna get a y, which is again, these are gonna represent a angle. These y's represent angles. That angle is going to be between zero and pi. I always like to visualize this from the unit circle. So for sine, or sorry, for cosine, it's gonna be between zero and pi. And for sine and tangent, it's going to be between negative pi halves and pi halves. So I always like to look at it like this way. Okay, so that is going to be the restrictions on that angle. Now, why is this so important? Why is this such a great tip? Because this is exactly what you need to make sure you remember when you're working on evaluating inverse tangents. And you can also do things rather, rather quickly because of that. So there's two ways that the inverse or knowing your restrictions can come into play. The first one is just going to be a composition when we're dealing with the unit circle. So if we had something like this, we had sine of sine inverse of negative one, well, again, if we're trying to go ahead and evaluate, well, what is the sine inverse of negative one? The cool thing we need to know about trigonometric functions and their inverse functions is they're inverses of each other, right? They're going to undo each other. So whenever you have your inverse is going to be inside of your other trigonometric function, you always wanna work inside out, right? So always gonna work this way first. So this problem is going to be fairly simple because the answer is just gonna be negative one because the sine and the sine inverse are gonna undo each other. But if we work on this step by step, you'll see why the restriction's not gonna come into play here. If I just take the sine inverse of negative one, basically that's asking me, what is going to be the angle on this restriction where y is going to equal a negative one, right? Because remember on the unit circle, the sine of a value is representative of the y coordinate on the unit circle. So you can see over here, we have zero comma negative one. Well, what is that angle within this restriction? Well, it's gonna be this angle down here, which is going to be a negative pi halves. Then if I take the sine of negative pi halves, that's just gonna represent the y coordinate, which again is equal to a negative one. But here is where knowing your restrictions is going to come into play and be so important. Okay. So now we have a composition where it's actually switched around. Now we have the sine inverse of sine of three pi over two. So again, always work from the inside out. So what is sine of three pi over two? Well, if you were to graph that, that'd be all the way over here. Now you might be thinking and saying, no, oh, Mr. McCulligan, that's the exact same point. That's equal to a negative one. Yeah, but a lot of students, what they'll do is they'll say, oh, these two cancel each other out. I got negative one. So these two cancel each other out. So therefore it's equal to a three pi over two. No, we have to know our restrictions. We have the sine of three pi over two, right? That's equal to a negative one. So sine inverse of negative one, well, we know that answer. What is going to be the sine inverse of negative one? That's equal to a negative pi halves. So the answer here is a negative pi halves. So make sure you understand your restrictions when you're doing that composition. The other play where knowing your restrictions or the other reason why knowing your restrictions is so important or such a helpful hit tip is when you have to go ahead and graph a triangle. So let's say I had something like this. Okay, so in this case, I have cosine of sine inverse and negative three over five. Now in this case, we're gonna draw a triangle, but there's a problem. We don't know what is this triangle going to look like? It's a negative three over five, right? Because remember, it could be opposite over adjacent, or I'm sorry, opposite over hypotenuse, or the triangle could look like this, negative three and five. But since I know my restrictions has to be either in the first or the fourth quadrant, this is not gonna be my triangle. This is gonna be the triangle I'm gonna to wanna to work with. Now, let's move on to tip number two. All right, now tip number two is actually one of those that can make your life so much easier, and that is to look for no solutions. <laughs> 
So there's something really, really important to remember about these trigonometric functions. If I have a right triangle, right, it's gonna look something like this, and here's going to my angle, right? And we have our hypotenuse, we have the opposite side, and we have our adjacent, and I guess I should just label the hypotenuse. Well, remember, ladies and gentlemen, the hypotenuse is always going to be larger than our opposite and our adjacent side. So if I go ahead and rewrite the sine of, let's say, an angle, and I get something that has a ratio of this, three over two. Well, let's go and draw what that would look like on a triangle. And immediately you can see there's a problem, right? Because now my opposite side, because it's always opposite over hypotenuse, my opposite side is larger than my hypotenuse. Therefore, you can see that this is going to have no solution. So any time that we're dealing with a sine and a cosine of a value that's going to be larger than one, we automatically know, ladies and gentlemen, there is going to be no solution. However, just notice that for tangent, remember tangent is, I don't know what this is going to be, let's just, let's do the triangle like this. <laughs> I know over here, tangent is opposite over adjacent. They don't make any reference to what the hypotenuse is. So tangent can have a value of that is larger than one, so if you need to find the inverse. The reason why this is so important, or the reason why I'm bringing this up, is sometimes we'll get a problem that looks like this. And you might say, all right, well, let's go and evaluate. Well, I go into this point right here, and I recognize, well, what is going to be the cosine inverse of four? Well, remember, ladies and gentlemen, I can never take the cosine inverse of a value that's going to be larger than one. The sine and the cosine of any angle is always going to be less than one. It's going to be between zero and one. So therefore, you can see, or you can see a negative as well. You can see that in this case, since the cosine inverse is a four, that's not gonna work within that restriction. So therefore, because technically this is saying the cosine of what angle equals four. How can you have the adjacent over the hypotenuse where your adjacent side is larger than your hypotenuse? It doesn't work. So that's a quick little easy way to recognize, oh, I can't take the cosine inverse or the sine inverse of a number that's larger than one. So therefore I immediately have no solution. However, be wary, with tangent, you can go ahead and do that. Now, on to tip number three. So tip number three is to, when you have values that are not on the inner circle, look to create a triangle. So when we're first teaching the composition of inverse trig functions, you know, a lot of times we're just dealing with values that we see on the inner circle. They might look something like this. Or they might look something like this. Either way, you're always gonna have some problems that you recognize that, oh, this is a value on the unit circle, this is going to be an angle that's on the unit circle, and so therefore, I can use my unit circle and use my restrictions. But remember I talked about in the first tip of knowing your restrictions. Restrictions are important when you're dealing with values that are on the unit circle and angles that are on the unit circle, as well as when you're dealing with triangles. So let's take a look at a problem where we would need to create a triangle. Let's actually use exactly this, but let's just change up some of the problems. Okay, so what if I had something on this? Now, I know square root of two over two, that is a point that's on the unit circle. I know what that cosine value is. I can immediately go ahead and evaluate that. However, when I look over here, I say the sine cosine inverse of three over four. Well, I don't know three fourths as a value that's on the unit circle. However, what I can do is go ahead and create, and actually, you know what, let's make this a negative because let's have a little fun with those restrictions, right? So let's have a negative three over four. Now we know that the hypotenuse is never going to be uh, negative. So I have two triangles that's going to work. I have a triangle in the second quadrant as well as a triangle in the third quadrant. However, we know our restrictions of cosine, right, are between zero and pi. So the only angle that would work would be dealing with this triangle right in here. So I can immediately just go ahead and forget about this one right there. I'm sorry, that is a negative three and that's a four, okay? So now what we need to do is we need to find the sine of this. Well, if I need to find the sign for this angle right here, I need to know what this opposite side is. So I have the adjacent side, I have the hypotenuse. What is the one thing that kind of comes to mind when we have the adjacent and the hypotenuse and we need to find the opposite? That would come with, I think it starts with a P, Pythagorean theorem, all right. So remember, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Or what I like to summarize it as, leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared. So we have one leg, we do not have the other leg, and we have the hypotenuse. So three squared is going to be a nine, plus a b squared equals a 16, minus a nine, minus a nine. b squared is going to equal 
do, 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 that's going to be a seven. Now, when I introduce the square root, make sure you are including the plus or minus, because again, it does matter on the restrictions. If you had a positive would be up here, a negative would be down here. Now, obviously we know the restriction is going to be in these first and second quadrant. So therefore my B is going to be, my opposite side is going to be a positive value. But sometimes you have to use a negative value if you have triangles down here. So B is going to equal a positive square root of seven. Now we're not gonna use the approximation 2.6457513. We'll just keep it as the square root of seven. So this will be the square root of seven. And then I wanna say, well, what is the sign of this cosine inverse for this triangle that we just created. Well, that's gonna be the square root of seven over four, right? Which is opposite over hypotenuse. So always work from the inside out. So the sign of this angle right here is going to be a square root of seven over four. Hope that helps.